Calling all detectives. Private detectives get all sorts of clients. But I once had a murder case in which my client was me. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. Many people think that a private detective like me, Jerry Browning, has a lot of special rights and privileges. Far from it. I was sitting at a small table in the Montmartre, which is one of those intimate nightclubs. With luck, I hoped to see Johnny Laughlin walk into the place sometime during the evening. I wanted Johnny for having worked the Flim Flam, one of the basic confidence games, on a man now my client. The man who pushed his way across the floor to my table was tall, dark, heavy-shouldered. Listen, Jake. You better make girly get in or slap your nose to the back of your head. I blinked. You're talking to the wrong man, pal. I never saw you or your girl before. All that did was infuriate the guy. Who you trying to ritz? Stand up and fight or I'll knock that smike right off your puss. Under the circumstances, there was only one thing to do, and I did it. I yanked my blackjack from my pocket, kicked my chair out from under me, slapped the guy with the blackjack. An instant later, three other men surrounded me and had a gun. I struck out at him. Heard the bullet go past my ear, and from then on was too busy to notice anything. After what seemed like hours, the lights went on. I found myself in the grip of two husky cops. There was a still figure on the floor. Mister, you're under arrest for murder. I got into a fight at a nightclub and found myself charged with murder. The next morning, I had a talk with my lawyer, and Lieutenant Dawson came over to see me from headquarters. They were both optimistic. Jerry, we've got it pretty well established that the guy did pick the fight with you. The only question now is who killed him? My lawyer shrugged. That's not our question, Lieutenant. Jerry's innocent, and I want him released. Dawson nodded absently. Yeah, sure. That's just formality. He turned to me. Jerry, I want you to come down to the morgue, take a look at the body. We haven't been able to identify it yet. I stared at the still body lying on the morgue slab, and I dreaded what I had to say. Dawson... This is not the fellow who picked the fight with me. You mean this poor guy was just an innocent bystander? My lawyer got red in the face. That doesn't alter the circumstances. Jerry had nothing to do with it. A hoodlum picked a fight and... I shrugged. Save it for court. We're liable to need it. A license as a private detective is not a license to engage in brawls. Even though Mr. Browning did not actually shoot the victim, he is responsible for the conditions culminating in the murder. I hold him for the grand jury. However, I will accept a petition for bail. In the four days previous to my scheduled appearance before the grand jury, I moved heaven and earth to find out the identity of the murdered man. All I learned was that he'd come into the nightclub alone just a few minutes before the fight started, had been sitting at a table right behind mine. For a while, I thought that the murder had some connection with Johnny Laughlin, the confidence man I'd been trying to capture. But even that slim hope disappeared when I entered the grand jury room. The district attorney shook a bony finger in my face. Members of the grand jury, this man Browning has been a troublemaker for years. He claims to have been seeking the capture of Johnny Laughlin, who was in the custody of New Orleans police 24 hours before the nightclub murder, as Browning should have known if he were more interested in his business than in brawls. What do you say to that, Browning? I had one chance, and I took it. Members of the grand jury, this was no murder growing out of a casual brawl. I've uncovered evidence that makes me believe the whole thing was carefully staged. A fight picked in order to make a deliberate murder look accidental. I'm sure the man who started it did not know I was a detective. He, he picked on whoever was nearest, the real intended victim. But something happened in the course of the fight which makes me sure I can solve the matter if the grand jury will give a week to do it in. The grand jury believed me, and I walked out of there with at least a technical chance to clear myself. That stuff about a deliberately staged fight was something I'd thought up in a moment of desperation. But the more I thought about it, the better I liked it. And in a conference with Dawson that same day, 
Dawson, the victim came there to meet somebody. He had no papers on him because he didn't dare have any, and no money because he needed money badly. All that adds up to a lamister of some kind. Find out who's broken out of a jail lately or double-crossed a gang someplace, and we'll at least have the victim identified. We had the identification two days later. Jerry, our man is Sandy Purcell. Used to be an accountant. Ran the books for an eastern gambling syndicate, sold inside information to another gang, and disappeared right after that. It's clear as you, Jerry. Yeah, but that's not enough. There's a certain guy I still have to catch up with. Now that I knew the kind of man I was after, my problem became simpler. What I was looking for was a big man with a big pain in his head. Gangland has its own doctors, men who for many reasons are not permitted to practice medicine, but who, for a price, will extract a bullet or patch a cracked skull. That's why five days later I was waiting outside a grimy tenement building on the west side. It cost me $200 to learn this address, but I figured it was well worth it. It was about an hour later when the man walked down the tenement steps. His hat was pulled way down, but not far enough to conceal either his face or the white line of bandages under the hat. He was the man who'd started the nightclub fight. I held my blackjack in my hand as I stopped him. Hello, pal. How's your girlfriend these days? I thought he'd faint. Don't hit me. I'm a sick man. You you almost killed me the last time. I'll finish it this time. I twirled the blackjack, let him hear its lethal whistle. What do you say? We can talk at police headquarters. Or we can go to work right here. I'll talk any place. His name was Pete Terrell, and he worked as a dance hall bouncer, made extra money by beating people up on the side. He wasn't in on the actual murder, but he named the three men from Boston who'd hired him to start the nightclub fight that led to Sandy Purcell's murder. It was an old story. A guy who sells out a gang to another gang, then gets pushed off as useless. Sandy'd been threatening to talk unless he was taken care of. So they took care of him, though not as he expected. Terrell was lucky. He only got five years. Of the rest, one got the chair, two others life sentences. Like I said, it makes no difference who you are. When you step into a courtroom, all you get is justice. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. 